shower. Fisk. Hey everyone, Richard from Digital Foundry here, and this is Marvel Spider-Man, running on PlayStation 4 Pro in its 4K output mode with full HDR enabled. Yes, this is an HDR video, so if you have a supported playback device, happy days, you'll get to see the full HDR effect. If not, everything is tone mapped down to SDR, so yeah, just enjoy the chat. And joining me for this discussion, John Linneman. Hey Rich, ready to talk about some Spider-Man? Yeah, this is an interesting one because basically I've had you slaving over a hot PC and a hot console for the last week looking at this game. I've kind of dipped in in and out to uh, basically take a look at the game running in HDR. And, well, there's so much to discuss on this game. Where do we begin? Well, I mean, honestly, I guess the first part here is since this is an HDR video, I didn't really get to touch on that in my main analysis video. And I feel like the implementation here is understated, but solid, yet lacking control. And what I mean by that is, so obviously you get the more vibrant image that you'd expect from HDR. And honestly, it's one of those things I feel like I only really noticed it when I switched back to SDR from HDR. You know what I mean? Definitely, yeah. Because here's the thing. Um, I wasn't blown away by the HDR implementation uh, in Spider-Man. Uh, but it was a similar case, I thought, with Ratchet & Clank when I first tried that on the Panasonic uh, HDR screen that we've got. But then I played it on OLED and it was a game changer. But the point is that, you know, moving to Marvel Spider-Man here, I was kind of, you know, th there isn't like a Sea of Thieves moment or even a Far Cry 5 moment where the highlights are just like popping out of you, shouting out of you almost. But then... You know, your full edit, your 31 minute magnum opus of this game came in yesterday, obviously all captured in SDR. And it was like, whoa, this is very, very different to what I've been playing. Yeah, that's exactly right. Like you said, this is not a Sea of Thieves or Gran Turismo Sport kind of moment, but it does add a lot to the presentation and sort of gives it sort of a, um, I guess it feels like a broader overall color palette. It's just more vibrant and more attractive looking in general. And really, I think, uh, you know, that is one of its strongest points is the use of color and tone. So, as I say in that video, this game does not have dynamic time of day. It has specific times of day. But the benefit of that is that the artists are essentially able to tweak each one of those times of day to look as excellent as possible. So you don't really have any of those somewhat dull moments, you know what I mean? I think the thing that sort of uh, sums it up for me, two things, just just sort of the consistency first of all and correctness it just kind of everything just looks right if you see what i mean yeah especially i love their uh, implementation of like the lighting for instance the indirect lighting is excellent because you spend a lot of time in shadow within the world because you know it's a large city with a lot of skyscrapers so the skyscrapers cast shadows over the environment so you're not always directly illuminated by the sun but they do a great job of creating this sort of atmosphere of like, you know, the indirect light bounce from the sun. You know, it's baked, of course, but uh, I feel like it, it really pops in this game in a big way. And it just looks really natural, if you will. And speaking of that, something I didn't get to mention as well in that video that I found interesting is the size and scale of the streets. Now, you look at a game like Grand Theft Auto, Watch Dogs, any other urban environment based open world game, and typically they are focused on driving vehicles, right? So you have these really broad, super wide streets. They're designed to make it easy for the player to drive around. You know, you have your alleys here and there, but in general it's a pretty open game where Spider-Man takes what I think feels a little more realistic with its depiction of New York. The streets are not always that wide in fact a lot of them are fairly narrow or like you know limited in terms of number of lanes more like real life and i think that's because you know the designers didn't have to worry about uh, whether the player can easily drive through traffic here it's just because you're always swinging over the world and so it gives the environment a different feeling i think than a lot of other urban based open world titles and i i kind of found that kind of appealing and just it was different, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean, and it actually ties into something that I want to talk about and something which we might actually disagree on just a little bit, which is the swinging mechanic. Aha. Uh -huh. Because uh, you're a massive you're a massive fan of this, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's fantastic. It's To me, this is like the natural follow-up to what they did in Spider-Man 2, and by they, I mean Treyarch, who designed Spider-Man to the movie, the game, 
whatever you want to call it, <laughs> back in the mid, early mid two thousands, where the idea was, uh, Spider Man when he swings his web, he's designed to attach to actual structures, whereas the first Spider Man the movie which was like the first big kind of open map Spider-Man game. You could just kind of throw your web up in the air and he was essentially swinging on nothing. And I feel like this kind of continues that feeling of actually grabbing onto buildings with your web and using the momentum from your swing to sort of launch yourself through the air. Then there's this where you can sort of like, uh, there's like a targeting reticle that appears. It's sort of depth aware where you can target the edges of buildings and sort of like launch yourself towards those points and then vault off of them. There's even power-ups where you can essentially hit the ground, uh, do a quick roll, and then launch yourself forward from there. So there's like a, a really nice sense of momentum. And although it's not as complex, it actually kind of reminds me, and I say this in a positive way, of the remake of Bionic Commando, or the 3D Bionic Commando, <laughs> where, and that, you know, I know that's not the most popular game, but I really loved the swinging mechanic in that, and this kind of reminded me of that though obviously not as fiddly right but you say that you weren't as much of, of a fan of this okay well there's there's two things to this first of all going back to what you were saying about the varying width of the street what i really like about this is that um it actually adds to the sense of challenge in the swinging because you're kind of uh, particularly there's a there's a chase scene later on where you're up against the shocker and it's quite it's actually you know if you're not fully au fait with the system it's actually quite difficult to stay within his kind of uh, range before he makes his escape and it really is quite an interesting challenge because the width of the streets is changing and if you hit the building then you get a massive slowdown and he sort of has a much bigger chance of getting away so yeah i really like this idea of mixing things up by having these different widths of street and also there's the verticality of it because once you reach a certain height and you're reaching the kind of uh, zenith of a lot of the buildings there's actually a lot going on there in terms of uh, how the geometry is placed uh, there was a fantastic thing where i just used um you've, you've got as you said earlier you've got that uh, sort of thing where you can web onto a uh, object that's in close proximity and propel yourself forward using that. I actually went through the legs of a, of a water tower doing that and I got a, a bespoke animation. There's that word. Yes, <laughs> I love that. I love that one. <laughs> Which I didn't expect it, but it's kind of an example of how they're mixing things up and um, how you can get these kind of moments of gratification uh, that, that you weren't quite expecting. So I was expecting him just to kind of maybe propel himself above it, but you know, going through it, it was, it was just like awesome. It's kind of similar to those little showpiece uh, flourishes of animation they did in like the Sam Raimi movies. Oh, it's super impressive though, because essentially you have to transition from the normal gameplay animations to this custom animation, and it's so seamless that it just feels like you did it naturally, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> that's right, yeah. And other things I really like is the, um, as I said, the verticality of it. So typically in a Spider-Man game, you'd expect him to be, you know, way up high in the sky. But if you decide not to do that, if you decide to do sort of low-level swinging, uh, obviously the challenge is higher because you're more likely to hit something, but the... This is the other thing you mentioned in your video, is the density of the ground level detail. It's, it's a real thrill, isn't it? Oh yeah, that's actually one of my favorite things about it, is like buzzing the traffic. Uh, it just looks awesome. They did a good job of packing the streets in most instances. And what I really liked about that detail is the way they would sort of draw the vehicles in. Like, instead of just popping them into view, I mean, that does happen occasionally, but most often you can actually sort of see cars naturally entering the scene from side streets. So there's this sense that the traffic is always in action and and is sort of appearing in a more natural way instead of just popping in. And so buzzing through the traffic feels awesome. And with the camera angle being what it is, you know, it's... Yeah, that actually, that's a good point. The camera work in general is exceptionally good. Like, getting that just right in a game like this is difficult I would imagine but they sort of manage it in a way that's really keeps the momentum up and but without uh, obscuring visibility you know what I mean yeah I think sort of to return to my original point which disappeared in a in a foam of enthusiasm <laughs> the, uh, the thing that didn't work for me is that um, if you get it wrong while swinging 
Uh, a, there's no, well, apart from uh, losing ground on uh, an opponent you might be chasing, there's, there's no consequence. And secondly, the animation, which is awesome from start to finish, just looks a bit unwieldy when you just seem to kind of rebound off the side of a building. Kind of looks a bit odd to me. Yeah, I thought about this too, and it was like, you know, it would be cool to see Spider-Man slam into a building <laughs> and then maybe like use some sort of glass shattering animation, a crack texture, just to show the impact. Uh, there is actually a, a special animation if you just dive from a tall building and land on the street. He sort of does that superhero, like, squat kind of thing, you know? But uh, it's true that there's not that much of an impact effect there. And at that point, I almost wonder, I mean, when you watch a Spider-Man movie or you're reading the comics, they don't really show that much in the way of, like, Spider-Man slamming and breaking into objects because he's meant to be this like lithe nimble thing instead of like a big heavy bruiser so I mean maybe that's the reason they didn't opt to do that or maybe it was more of a gameplay uh, fluidity kind of thing but either way you're right it, there isn't much of an impact when you slam into a skyscraper yeah and then you know you're basic you know you lose energy when somebody with no superpowers whatsoever just punches you <laughs> and then at the same time zero consequence for your sort of going face first into a, into a skyscraper is kind of odd but i think you're right i think it's a gameplay thing because of, you know the game starts with basically mastering the basics of swinging and if there are, you know, if there is sort of stuff that, you know, basically, if, if your lack of experience with the system essentially slows you down, stops you getting around, it could represent unwanted friction in terms of, in terms of the gameplay. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing I really appreciate is the, uh, I guess you could say the transitions between the open world environment and the mission areas. So there is a loading screen, but the point is, is that they did design a lot of unique areas and like internal challenges, rooms, buildings, etc., uh, to act as mission areas. And this is one of the things I think that was so critical to games like Batman Arkham City, where sure you had this big open world, but you also had a lot of specially designed missions that could basically exist within the uh, framework of a linear action game instead of an open world game. And I think that is the kind of stuff that is key to making a memorable game like this. A lot of older Spider-Man games with the open world design, to me it always just felt like you were just randomly swinging around and stuff that happened would all just happen out on the streets. So it really never felt like you were doing that much more besides the actions in the open world. Uh, and having really polished, slick looking mission designs within the game like that adds a lot to the experience I feel and it shows the flexibility of Insomniac's engine more than anything yeah definitely there is you're right there's two very definite ways that the game presents you do have the open world stuff and you do have the interior stuff and the interior stuff generally introduces you to new gameplay concepts so for example uh, the stealth stuff yep which uh, is very similar in execution uh, I guess to Arkham Asylum more than more than any of the other Arkham titles. Yeah, for sure. Where it, it's basically about you know keeping out of sight, and they even have like a kind of a safety system there, which basically tells you whether it's safe to take out a guy without alerting any of the others. So that yeah, it definitely feels as though they're introducing new concepts there. But what I really like about that is that once you know those concepts are introduced, there are outdoor areas which are in the open world where those gameplay mechanics are equally as as, as sound so for example uh, the kingpin has various layers around the city which are in the open world but the stealth mechanics that you kind of learn in the interiors do kind of play out very similarly in the open world as well so there is that consistency there yeah that's true actually i mean the mechanics they hold true across the whole game and the engine is solid enough to present that level of granular detail without having to flip to a separate map it does all exist within that world uh and in fact there there's so uh, it's not so much i'm not going to say who but there's points where you play as other people or in other situations this d than just Spider-Man. And I feel like those types of gameplay moments also show some additional flexibility. And there's one in particular that I'm, that I'm going through now that does take place in the open world, but the actual level structure is surprisingly complex and dense. It's the kind of thing that really could exist in like, say, like a game like Splinter Cell, 
as just a standalone mission in terms of visual quality. Yet there it is. It's kind of out in the open world map. So that kind of stuff really impresses me. I think uh, what the interior stuff does is, again, as you pointed out in your video, it enables Insomniac to uh, create a kind of more crafted linear experience so you get that kind of type of gameplay as well. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I guess the one thing, I'll be curious to see the reactions to some of the stealth stuff. Like, I'm a big fan of stealth in games, but there's definitely some moments where you get a little bit of a trial and error feel. Not so much when you're playing as just Spider-Man, because he can engage in hand combat at any point, but some of the others. There's definitely some pass-fail stealth sequences in there. But still, it's neat to see that sort of stuff integrated into a game like this. Okay, John, so uh, we've had about, I don't know, 10 days with this game now, and obviously last week, the end of last week, uh, the, the whole downgrade thing blew up, and uh, I don't know. This is really difficult for us because we're under embargo and can't talk about it, and at the same time, it's like... You know, if only we could say what was really going on. Now, hopefully your video put a lot of people's fears to rest there. I mean, by and large, I mean, well, 99% of everything people are pointing out is essentially artist-driven changes. There's, there isn't a technological downgrade there, but there are some additional notes I think we should probably cover. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, so one of the things I didn't really get to touch on in the video due to a lack of a nice asset or a comparable scene in the final game is there's this bit from the original E3 2016 trailer. And if you look back at that trailer, that's the one that I think looks the most different. That I think that's early enough in development where the team hadn't actually decided on the visual direction of the game as a whole yet. They were still refining that. And so if you look at that versus the final game, there is definitely arguments to make that certain things are worse, but I, there's still overall, I think the final game looks better. But, you know, when designing this stuff, I don't think anybody's ever going like, well, let's fool these people. It's more about what can we do? And it's the designers themselves figuring out what's possible. And I think the 2017 trailer shows very much what the game is like. I mean, it looked unbelievable at the time, but that's exactly how the game plays. And it's honestly, overall, I think the 2017 demo does not look quite as refined as the final game. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think the evidence in your video is pretty compelling there in terms of, well, uh, for a start, the Spider-Man costume. There was a lot of discussion about that, but it is essentially just a change in material property. That That's basically it, isn't it? Yeah, and I kind of think the newer, like simulating cloth properly is a little more difficult than that plasticky look that the original suit went for. I mean, you have to take into account you know, the freno of the suit and like the general, like the way light plays off those fabrics. I mean, getting material to look really good as cloth is seems to be an artistically challenging thing. Not that many games pull it off that well. And I think Spider-Man does a pretty great job there, actually. And in fact, Insomniac themselves during a stream or something at some point in the last year, they were like talking about this topic where some fans were disappointed with the plasticky look of the suit and they said yeah we're looking at this we're trying to figure out ways to make it look more cloth like but then you even go one step further in this final game and you see oh there's there's actually like 30 costumes unlockable <laughs> and some of them actually are glossy if you really want that look so there's a bunch of different types of costumes you can put spider-man in they all have different types of materials on them so if you really want a different look it's it's there it's just the default costume now looks more fabric-y. And that's something that's sort of confirmed from the very first cutscene as well, where they show uh, Peter Parker putting on the suit. You know, they sort of pick up his mask from the table and he's trying to put on the leggings and it all looks very cloth-like. So I think in that sense, they nailed the look of the material. Mm -hmm. I think that, again, your video has probably done it, but this whole technical downgrade thing, you actually saw the 2017 demo playing in real time on PlayStation 4 Pro hardware, right? Yeah, I went to an E3 demo with it, and they had a development PS4 console that looked like a Pro, not the actual dev kit, which I've seen, sitting there. And it was, I believe when I first walked in, it was actually sitting at the PS4's dashboard just sort of like, you know, the the menu system. And they clicked on the Spider-Man thing and it launched back to the main menu of the demo version. And then they actually had uh, multiple Insomniac guys in the room. One of them was narrating what was happening and taking questions. And then there was another guy holding a controller 
just like you know at the cyberpunk demo for instance basically sitting back there playing the demo so it did play out differently than the actual pre-recorded footage that was shared with everybody else during the conference you know so it was it was a real controllable thing running on the real hardware and I think, you know, as as we say in the video, the, the big thing that you pick up on is the reflection stuff. And that is really just an art thing. I mean, both versions are using cube maps mixed with uh, screen space reflections. And it just so happens that for the demo, they crafted a really nice cube map and carefully aligned it to that room. Uh, and it looks awesome. But getting really nicely aligned cube maps that line up with every environment, that's not an easy thing to do, and you don't see it done that often for that reason, I think. I mean, artistically, that's usually an expensive thing, and updating cube maps in real time, uh, that's typically reserved for driving games for a reason, like on the car surface. That's, as I understand, it's a pretty expensive operation, so it's not like you're going to be doing that either. So I think for this case, it's just a matter of what's a good way to communicate sort of a reflective surface in a way that we can apply more broadly. And so I think they, they're a little bit more generalized with their cube maps. But also, I was walking uh, down the street the other day, and uh, it had just drizzled, the road was wet. And if you actually look at the sky reflecting in that, the final version is more realistic in most situations, in terms of the way reflections appear diffuse. It's much closer to real life, where you can't really make out the buildings after, you know, with just a damp ground like that. But in the case of that specific room with the larger puddles, then yeah, you'd expect uh, sharper reflections and replacing that cube map with the more generic one, I think, does reduce that effect. So in that sense, yes, I do think the E3 reflection looks better, even though technically speaking, they're doing exactly the same things. It's just the texture itself is different. Yeah, sure. And the move to uh, adaptive resolution scaling and the fact that it seems to that this area seems to be running at 1584p not the 1440p we've seen in prior demos. It suggests that far from technical limitations, there is actually overhead in that particular area. Yeah, they definitely seem to have some performance overhead over the E3 demo, which again, that was a 1440p demo like Ratchet and Clank with the temporal injection method, which, you know, they're also using that for the final game. But yeah, the overall average resolution is higher in the final game than it was in the demo. So I want to return to lighting because I think this is one of the, the, the most brilliant things about this game. It has some absolutely standout moments, but even, I don't know, you kind of take it for granted almost because everything is, you know, kind of like the HDR, correct and consistent. It, you know, from start to finish, everything just sits perfectly within the environment, whether it's the character costumes, skin rendering, a particular favorite material I saw was like Mary Jane's uh, brown leather jacket. It's it's uncanny. Yeah, that I agree. That looks great. All of the clothing material in general looks awesome. And they even added some details like the coats blowing in the wind from the helicopter blades, for instance, in that one cutscene. And the way the material looks and the way it behaves is really, really nice. They did an awesome job there. And also another thing people have pointed out from comparing footage from other builds is the hair has changed. Uh, if you look closely at the 4K shots, you can see that they're using sort of an alpha to coverage method for filtering that. And I suspect changes to the hair were again made to reduce aliasing. Because the pattern is, is similarly complex, but the textures are layered slightly differently. And it looks extremely clean during gameplay. And I'd imagine the, with the way it was arranged before, you know, it was probably just a more shimmery effect in general. So again, I think the hair and overall rendering of the individual people in the game it has improved and it looks awesome yeah another thing which i found kind of interesting is that um certainly in the comics and uh, maybe even in the movies the the kind of portrayal of the characters you know everyone is super attractive but, <laughs> but do you know what i mean but in in the game that you know spider-man is of course the classic everyman superhero and it's something that was kind of lost uh, back in the day but here, you know, he does kind of pass for an, an everyday kind of guy as opposed to, you know, some kind of beefed up, super handsome Hollywood A-lister. Actually, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. But all of the characters in the game, they're just like average looking dudes or, you know, ladies. Like there's nothing, you know, they do look like they could just be everyday people doing their thing. And Peter Parker himself, you know, he's just like this guy. <laughs> but it works. 
Yeah, I think the thing that it kind of ties into what Insomniac are doing with the DNA of the franchise almost, where this is their own take on, you know, but basically Spider-Man debuted 1962. So, you know, there's decades upon decades of mythology here. Lots of stuff that just doesn't kind of make sense anymore. They've taken what matters from uh, the main characters, the supporting cast, and, and crucially the rogues gallery, and everything has like a new spin on it. So although it's very, very familiar and there's lots of Easter eggs in the background for the comics fans, it kind of feels fresh and exciting and new. And it's similar in a sense to what they're doing in the in the movies, I think. Well, I really like the fact that they didn't decide to do A, another origin story, or B, like a high school Spider-Man. Like this is kind of like Spider-Man that's been doing Spider-Man for years now. <laughs> so it's kind of, he's kind of an established figure in the city. And so this is like a new story in the life of Spider-Man and from a different perspective than you might have expected for what is essentially a new game franchise, if you will. Like there's been a lot of Spider-Man games, but this is the new spin on it from a different company that's worked on it before. And I, I, I was surprised actually at how effective the storytelling in general is. It's really well done. And um, it's, I, I did enjoy that part a lot. Right, so if we look at open world superhero games, I think the King of the Hill is probably Batman Arkham Knight at this point. So how do you think uh, Marvel Spider-Man compares. So that's an interesting one for me then, because I agree, like, uh, Arkham Knight is an absolutely gorgeous game, and it still is today. It has a couple limitations, though. One, the console versions technically, I think, offer the most robust presentation. I don't think the PC version was ever fully patched up to match every single effect just right. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but either way, those versions are stuck at 1080p, the PC version has never been perfect, so I feel like there's not been as perfect a way to play it today as there is with Spider-Man. And on top of that, uh, the level of detail is super high in that game, the character models are superb, but I feel like we've seen some advancements in certain rendering techniques since then, like the ambient lighting and uh, such in Spider-Man I think has improved over that, but at the same time, man, just the overall package that Arkham Knight presents, like the post-processing combined with the rain and the water and just the exceptionally good character models, like some of the best I think I've ever seen, like that is just a perfect, perfect package. The, the, the art direction in that is unbelievably good. So to me, it's like, I feel like they're kind of maybe at the same level. Like obviously Spider-Man has a lot of advantages, but it goes for, I guess you could say what... <sighs> Spider-Man's trying to do more difficult stuff in terms of rendering. Like doing a bright city that's super well lit like that is is more difficult to render in a convincing manner than the dark, wet streets of of Arkham Knight. Like that is kind of just easier to pull off because you can it sort of conceals its limitations more and can look more realistic. So in that sense, you know what Insomnia is doing is pretty ambitious, but. The one area where Spider-Man really just can't touch Arkham Knight, it's it's the rain. Did you did you experience any of the rainy bits in uh, Spider-Man? Yeah, uh huh. It's it's fine, I guess, but uh, it's not especially impressive. I mean, the reflections look nice, but the rain effect itself is pretty limited. It's just small little raindrops sort of puttering around the screen. Whereas in Arkham Knight, it's still just such a beautiful rain effect, and it really feels like you're like driving through a storm at times i love it well i have some notes here i think uh the the basic nighttime rendering of all of the time of day bakes that insomniac did it's kind of like the one that works least for me i think yeah i agree actually um and in that respect i mean you know obviously arkham knight is built entirely around that aesthetic <laughs> um <laughs> so yeah i mean that is an area where i think uh, rocksteady is still ahead but in virtually every other way, I'm kind of Team Spidey here. First of all, world building in Arkham Knight, obviously, they empty the city. There's barely anyone in it. Ah, oh, that's true. <laughs> Whereas yeah. um, Insomniac have, I think they've gone beyond the Call of Duty because when you go down to street level, it is far denser, far more packed than I honestly thought they would attempt. It's it's really rather impressive, the amount of detail that they cram in there. Uh, where do we begin? Uh, NPCs, they don't skimp on the amount of them. They, they've got some interesting techniques for rendering them at distance that keeps them cheap. Mm -hmm. But the point is that, you know, it's convincing. You're getting the idea that there's a bustling cityscape here. Secondly, that the traffic 
density. Uh, yeah, it, it, again, in your video, you pointed out that there's a, kind of like a lack of variety in the uh, cars. Uh, in the cars, although they do have individual number plates, I think you noted. Yep. <laughs> but again, the density of vehicles that's going on there is really impressive. And the parkour, when you're kind of just vaulting over all of the cars, they didn't need to do that, but it's there and I appreciate it. And it just really, really works for me. Secondly, building interiors, there's very little of that in Arkham, but what they're doing here in, in Spider-Man is really impressive. So at ground level, at street level, a lot of the buildings have bespoke interiors, which is really, really nice. And a lot of that ties into side missions, you know, like shops can be held up and whatnot. So, you know, it really works from that perspective in giving you the idea that there is actually a city with life in it, that, that, you know, there is stuff going on that isn't superhero related. And secondly, that really neat trick, uh, which you kind of demonstrated for good and bad in your video, which is the, uh, you yeah, know, when you're doing the web swinging, you land on a building and you're high up in the sky. There's the illusion that every building, you, you know, you can look through the window and yep. see what's going on in there. <laughs> I love that trick, too. I mean, when, you, when you're swinging, it, it does look effective. Like, it really seems like the buildings have depth because they do. It's just that, uh, you know, it's a bunch of cubes yeah. <laughs> some with often repeating textures. And when you look at the corner of a building, it's like if you look at a corner office, like you look at it from one angle and it's one thing. And you go around the corner, you look in from the other side and, oh, it's a different room. Which kind of just kind of reveals the trick, like that, you know, it's like looking under the hat there. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, nobody really is going to do that. I mean, we were testing the, you know, to see how it worked, and that's how we revealed, you know, how they've done it. But, you know, in terms of uh, giving extra depth to the city and the idea that there's more to it than a series of just basic buildings, it's just really, really well done. I also have to say, you know, we were talking about cube maps earlier and how they were reduced in that one specific scene. But in terms of the usage of cube maps for building reflections and things like car reflections, they've increased the resolution there. The, the quality of the reflections has greatly improved from the older builds. And that's actually one of the high points, I think, is just the general look of the building reflections is shockingly convincing. Like do, doing a large piece of glass that the player is swinging directly towards or next to. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's that's a difficult thing to figure out how to do artistically without something like ray tracing hardware in the RTX cards. Uh, so, you know, they do a pretty good job of faking it. Like, because you're not that aware of specifically what's around you when you're swinging up in the air like that. So it really does give this sense of depth, like you're actually looking at reflections in a building. And it works. It's it's really convincing. The cube maps are high resolution, and it's neat how they use different cube maps based on height, and all the different buildings use different. Well, I mean, it's just it's a very clever solution, and I got to tip my hat to them for that one. Yeah, I think the overall effect is just stunning, and uh, yeah, there is this kind of big discussion at the moment with the arrival of RTX about faking it versus the real thing. And uh, I think what this game is demonstrating is that, you know, when you've got a talented developer fully in command of the hardware, <laughs> they can get some remarkably good faking going on there. And there's, you know, some people were even kind of suggesting that maybe there was some kind of ray tracing going on in Spider-Man. I think your, your video kind of demonstrated that's not the case. But at the same time, the way they've done it, the way they've produced the, the, the results like this, it's really, really impressive. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very talented art and technical team there i you know i'm just impressed with insomniac's engine like it's continued to impress me uh this generation in particular they've really so i guess it was you know ratchet and clank looks absolutely phenomenal on the ps4 uh sunset overdrive is one of my favorite open world titles of the generation as well and it does have you know some lot issues here and there but man it looks so cool in motion it's just a colorful beautiful game and you know this is they've been doing a lot of vr projects as well of course and this is just a continuation of their work. And I feel like this might actually be, I suspect this is Insomniac's highest budget game to date by far. That's just my guess there. But this, this feels like uh, the team was given all the resources necessary to like really pour everything they've got into a project. And this is what they were able to achieve. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy for those guys that they had the chance to work with Spider-Man and do something like this. And 
I hope, you know, that they see success because Insomniac, as many people are aware, is still, they're an independent developer, really. Yeah. I mean, they do work on multiple platforms. You know, they, they do have a close working relationship with Sony, but they are not a first party studio. So uh, they, they, they need this success a lot, I think. And, and I feel like, you know, they've earned it with this one. Good stuff. Right then. Well, I think we're going to round things off there. Thanks so much for joining me on this one, John. And I think, uh, you know, special congratulations on the video you produced for this one because it's uh, an epic to say the least. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, well, as always, please do like and subscribe to support the kind of work we do here at Digital Foundry. And yes, ring the bell for instant notifications whenever a new video drops. And if you'd like to see this video at the very best possible quality, uh, full HDR, remember, uh, please do consider the DF Patreon. But that's all from us for now. Thanks for watching.